I'm here from Radiation Safety Image Physics Department. What we're in charge of is monitoring staff doses. We keep track of patient doses, tweak protocols, initiate new, new imaging protocols, that sort of thing. And then we go around and uh, we'll go around and uh, test, make sure the image quality of the machines is, is appropriate and those sorts of things. Uh, make sure that the image quality versus doses, radiation doses for the patients are, are good. Um, the takeaway is that wherever you go, wherever you're privileged, uh, any hospital that uses radiation, they'll have an x-ray radiation safety officer, a radioactive material safety officer for PET and nuclear medicine, uh, and maybe therapy, and uh, then medical physicists. So the stuff I'm going over today, every hospital should have somebody that knows this stuff if you can track them down. <laughs> um, before I get into the actual safety stuff, I thought it might be um, useful to go over how the physics behind, or real high level physics behind how these things actually work so you can appreciate the hazards a little bit better. So with that, uh, let's jump straight into MRI. This used to be called nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, but the nuclear part scared people, so they took that off. Um, so what happens is every atom in your body has this sort of resonance frequency where if I hit it with electromagnetic uh, radiation, it will re-radiate that. So electromagnetic is radio waves, basically. And in, in MR, actually, we are sending and receiving FM radio waves. So this is why the room is shielded pretty well, because the radio tower would screw everything up. The trouble is, with you or I right now, these atoms are all oriented in, in various directions. And so if I tried to image, all of those radio towers transmitting in your body would cancel out, and I wouldn't hear anything. But if I stick you in an extremely strong magnetic field, hundreds of times stronger than what's on your refrigerator at home. Now all of these atoms sort of align in the same direction. The stronger the magnetic field, the better the alignment, the better the signal. So if I send in a radio wave into the patient now, all of them align and add up to give me a signal. So I'll stick a little uh, radio receiving antenna on top of the patient and I can image each voxel. Each voxel is just a little square of where I'm trying to image and I can go through the patient in 3D and image each voxel. Now, obviously, that takes a long time to go through that. So that's the downfall of this. Uh, and I get better images from things that move easily, fluid, fat, that sort of thing, bone, not so good. So there's sort of the limitations. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. And we can do functional or we can see just, you know, gray-white matter differentiation if that's what you're interested in. X-rays. Um, the way we take an X-ray image is actually very similar to what's working in your camera, on your camera phone. Light for a camera bounces off an object, the sensor records that. Uh, with X-rays, we're dealing with 20, 30, 40,000 times the energy of light structurally the exact same thing. It's an electromagnetic wave, just much higher energy, so it's able to penetrate through things, and we stick basically the same sensor that's in your camera on a wall, and we can image what's going through the patient. You know, the downfall is it's taking a 3D image and projecting it 2D. <clears throat> so, um, uh, is that not working now? All right, so sorry about that. It was uh, stuck for a second. Uh, a 2D image, um, but if I take an x-ray and sort of shoot it through and it either stops in a bone or goes through tissue, I'm just getting a black and white image, and that doesn't do me much good. So what I do is take a spectrum of x-rays, just like your camera takes a spectrum of light, and you can see detail there. Well, if I take a spectrum, some gets absorbed in bone, some only goes through lung tissue, whatever. Now I can make out contrast and see heart and vasculature and ribs and those sorts of things. The drawback of x-ray image, all x-ray imaging, is only about 1% goes through the patient to form an image. So there's a lot of absorption in, in the body and, and realistically in the surface of the patient. Um, 
and the other drawback with uh, projection imaging like this is if I have a lung nodule right behind a rib, I'm not going to see it. It's projected 2D. Well, what happens now if I take that x-ray and rotate it around the patient? I get a 3D image, and now I can separate that nodule from that rib. Not only that, but because of what I'm doing with the x-rays, it's a little bit different. I inherently can see contrast a little bit better. So gray-white matter shows up in CT better than it would a projection radiograph, for example. And then I can take that 3D information and trace out vasculature or get uh, uh, you know, more useful information than just a projection image. The drawback is for an equivalent study, say a chest X-ray versus a chest CT, um, probably 10 times more radiation for the CT. So you got to kind of bear that in mind. <clears throat> the other uh, type of radiation we're using is, uh, is radioactive material. So we're injecting in nuclear medicine, this is mammarian's realm, we inject radioactive material into a patient to trace some process. So this is a functional exam. The, the issue with radioactive material is I have to select something that's not radioactive very long because the patient's going to leave radioactive. So with this technetium, which is what we use for um, nuclear medicine, they're, they're probably measurably radioactive for a couple of days. Um, but we limit how much we're going to inject so that they're not irradiating people on the bus ride home and that sort of thing. Um, there's pretty strict limits for all of that that we follow. Um, but if I take an isotope that is not very long radioactivity, it doesn't have very long radioactivity, something that I can bind, for example, if I bind to um, uh, a phosphorus type material, let the patient cook for a while, I can see where in the bones that's taken up. Well, in adults, you know, some actively growing bones is, is not a real good sign, right? Uh, this is a favorite for uh, breast cancer, it tends to metastasize to bones pretty quickly, so those guys will all get bone scans. Um, and I can do something similar, something that, that evenly distributes through the heart muscle or something that stays in the lung. But since I'm dealing with a radioisotope all at one energy, I'm back to this sort of all or nothing image. So I get pretty poor resolution on the radioisotopes compared to a CT or an X-ray where I get exquisite resolution of tenth of a millimeter. Uh, that's my best resolution. The drawback is it's 2D projection. Uh, and, and similarly, I have PET. Uh, it's another functional exam, but I'm taking images around the body so I get a little bit better resolution. I can combine these with a CT image and overlay the two and get some more information out of there about where the cancer is, for example. Uh, so it's better resolution. Both of these, uh, nuclear medicine and PET, are pretty time consuming because the first step is injecting the patient and letting them sit for it to trace wherever the function you're, you're trying to see. And then it takes a little bit longer to image them as opposed to an x-ray, which is instantaneous, or CT that may take two, three seconds to scan. And then the, the PET patient also is a little radioactive. We tell patients 12 hours. That's probably a little bit long for realistically how long they're radioactive. Um, you know, like I said, we have limits on this that uh, we're, we're tightly controlling what members of the general public are allowed to receive. Uh, ultrasound, um, it, it always, kind of amazes me uh, when, you know, Dr. Gupta looks at an ultrasound and says, oh yeah, this is a healthy heart. I, I look at it and see a map of Europe. I don't know how they get <laughs> any information off of these things. The, the trouble is we're sending a sound wave out that's already sort of poor resolution, if you will, compared to x-rays. Um, and then you've got all this scatter going on. I'm trying to listen for the echo off of, say, one rib, and I get interference from the other ribs coming back, and trying to discriminate that in just the probe is difficult. So I get very low resolution scans off of ultrasound, um, but it's actually fairly good for imaging 
high density changes. So if I'm going through tissue and all of a sudden hit bone or all of a sudden hit a void of air or something like that, those give me really strong reflections and they're pretty easy to see. It's a fast process. There's no radiation involved like MRI. We say there's electromagnetic radiation, but it's radio waves, so it's, you know, no, no real hazard there. Uh, ultrasound, again, no, no hazard as opposed to the radiation procedures that we're talking about. It's where everybody in the room is at so know, when they come real in. Real high here. level, hopefully I'm but not the insulting one take away your really want to convey it's hard to judge. is imaging is always a trade-off. I can give you exquisite MRI images, it'll just take three hours to scan the patient, or an unacceptably high level of dose for a CT exam. Um, so you kind of have to be cognizant and weigh the, uh, be always cognizant of the risks versus benefits of the patient. Be cognizant and weigh the, uh, be always cognizant of the risks versus benefits of the patient and what you really need from those uh, exams, what information you're trying to gather. Um, and then, you know, like, like was mentioned before, there's some minor risks uh, with uh, contrast reactions, uh, decreased renal function or uh, allergic reactions to iodine, that sort of thing. Do you have to sedate a child in an MR because the scan takes so long? All right, so let's jump into some of the risks. So MR, no radiation, but remember that really huge magnet. So about once a year, I probably hear of some sort of flying object in, a, in an MR that hurts somebody or kills somebody. This is a really big deal because you're not getting you know, anything out of the magnet. It's so strong, you can't pull it off. So you have to actually ramp down the magnet, check it for damage, ramp it up. And I'm pretty sure an administrator is gonna notice that you have a, a week's, of, week's worth of lost revenue in an MR magnet. Somebody's probably losing their job over that, right? Um, and more, more recently, you know, I mean, you can imagine an aneurysm clip, say, that isn't MR compatible and rips off. That's pretty, pretty bad situation. But there's more subtle things with tattoo ink that has iron in it that conducts. So any loop of wire, any magnetic field moving creates electricity. That's how a generator station works that electricity will heat up and burn people. So we get tattoos that actually burn people because they have high levels of metal. We see um, metal fibers in clothing. This is why we put patients in, in scrubs to go in here. Um, we can see burns from metal fibers in clothing. These are uh, you know, moderate risks compared to flying objects that kill people probably once or twice, once every other year maybe. Is, the, the rate I hear, I remember hearing on that. So an MR scan takes a long time, not only because of the scan and how long that takes, but we spend a lot of time um, interviewing patients, scanning patients, making sure there's no hidden uh, uh, piercings that are gonna fly out. Um, it's just sort of a cost of, of doing business, I guess. The other non-radiation modality, ultrasound, uh, if you go through literature, you find all these things that are possible heating. We actually use ultrasound to heat tumors and kill them, uh, cavitation, uh, mechanical forces from ultrasound. But realistically, if you uh, are getting or sending a patient for an ultrasound on an FDA-approved ultrasound machine, the mechanical forces, the heat is limited, so you're really not going to see any of these things. So the risk is extremely low from uh, ultrasound. Of course, you're not going to see anything, or I don't see anything. Maybe you guys can. Um, Non-radiation, now let's move into the radiation, the CTs, the x-rays, the PET, nuclear medicine. We're going to lump all of this together because it's essentially the same hazard. And we know that radiation has a certain effect on tissues. Cells that are cycling rapidly through their cycle, that are non-specialized, that have a long reproductive life, these are cells that are most sensitive to radiation. Well, that's the very definition of infants, 
you know, fetus uh, embryos, that sorts of things. So that's why we are a little more paranoid with children and pregnant women. Um, but we take this information that mostly is collected from accidents, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we try to assign limits. Uh, this is worker limits now. There are no limits for patients. It is assumed that every imaging study with a patient, some physician or somebody has weighed the benefit versus the risk, and the benefit far outweighs any risk from radiation or whatever the hazard might be. The contrast reaction, for example, also. Um, you know, so we assign these limits. These are, are for staff and assigned to ensure that we're not going to have any problems based on, on these observed sort of sensitivities. Uh, pregnancy, you know, we know there's all kinds of nasty things from Hiroshima that happen to children. The bottom line is you don't see them in imaging. We're talking very high doses. It, we're talking double your annual limit before we even reach a threshold where we're starting to see these things. So this is sort of a pretty, um, you know, you've got to get a, a several exams in a CT, for example, before a fetus is going to hit this level. So in my opinion, as a non-MD, recommending an abortion for a woman that's had a CT exam is unconscionable. You would never want to do this. You know, maybe if the woman is going to go through radiation therapy where you're purposely trying to kill tissues or something along those lines. Um, but it, it's very high levels before you see, uh, you know, even mental retardation or microcephaly or any of those sorts of things. Um, we know, you know, the, the eye, skin, those sorts of things are, are sensitive. Uh, so we set limits to try to prevent cataracts. Uh, we do see a little bit of cataracts popping up in uh, interventionalists. They may have some hair loss uh, in, on their legs, so I'll get to that in a minute. Um, burns, you don't see in staff. We see this in patients occasionally. It's going to take probably 45 minutes at the earliest before you're going to see a patient get reddening of the skin in a cath lab, say. Uh, it, takes, it takes a good bit of radiation, um, and, and these we're not really going to see at all. Um, so, it, you know, it says here cataracts are most likely. It's probably a fair statement. Uh, we, this is, you know, we do see burns. This goes back to that 1% getting through the patient, and a lot of it's absorbed on the skin. So if you're in a long procedure, you're getting a lot absorbed in that centimeter or so. We go to your annual limit. This uh, it all comes from that Hiroshima Nagasaki data, right? And what government agencies tried to do a long time ago is they looked at a safe industry. I have no idea what they called a safe industry, but they said, well, how many people in a 20-year career die in a safe industry? And then they tried to find a radiation dose that would give you that same amount of rate of death and called that safe. That's where this 5,000 a year, your limit came from. I have never seen anybody hit this limit in the hospital. Maybe in a nuclear power plant we might see something like this, um, but not around here. I don't even see half of this around here. Um, but this limit is designed to be such that I would expect to not see any uh, any any negative effects at any of these levels. Uh, part of the trouble is the data came from these very high accident scenarios, Chernobyl, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and then we didn't know what to do, so we just drew a straight line and said that risk correlates down to lower levels where we're at down here. Um, and the reality is lower levels are probably a lot less hazardous than we're assuming by telling you these numbers and these limits and things like that. Of course, these limits are based on cancer, the radiation destroying a DNA and it re being repaired improperly. Those limits come exclusively for cancer. That 5 rim is to prevent fatal cancers. But what we have seen 
from uh, Apollo missions is actually there's a pretty high rate of cardiovascular disease. Um, the astronauts are, are people who are chronically healthy, so they might have a 1% chance of cardiovascular disease in their lifetime, but these Apollo guys are upwards of 50%. So there's a huge correlation there to the radiation that they got. And in fact, the cardiovascular disease, a risk of cardiovascular disease at the same level, say at this same 5,000 a year, the risk of cardiovascular disease probably equals the risk of cancer. So that 5,000 probably should be dropped to 2,500 for death period, you know, not just cancer death. Um, these guys in, probably, what is it, two, three weeks trip to, uh, to the moon got probably as much radiation as an interventional cardiologist gets in 15 or 20 years. So does that mean my cardiologists have a risk of, of uh, cardiovascular disease? Probably not, because it's stretched out over 15 years, and it's a very low level. These guys are up here all, all at once. So lower doses of radiation are probably better tolerable because your body can heal. Lower doses of radiation over long periods of time, your body is able to recover from that. And, and there's some evidence, uh, if we look at people in uh, Denver, for example, they're getting two, three, four times the amount of radiation that you or I get here in Houston, but yet uh, people in Denver have lower cancer rates and they have lower um, birth defects than we do. So we think that cancer is actually pretty, uh, uh, pretty weak carcinogen. Uh, and that lends some credence to this sort of uh, tail, you know, that it sort of takes off up here. And we see this around the world from people that live in areas where there's naturally high levels of uranium and those sorts of things are getting large, large doses compared to you or I. Um, and, and this here is part of the problem. In this room, about 22% of us will die over our lifetime from cancer, just natural occurrences, not due to radiation, not due to whatever. Um, this is just here for sort of a reference that this is what all of us are getting, including medical exams nationwide. And this is our, um, our legal limit. So um, finding cancer in this huge background becomes a problem. So if we look at this, this is 10,000 millirem per year over 20 years. So this is double your legal limit, and it, it, this is based on this, uh, oops, where'd it go? Sorry. This is based on this linear limit here. I expect half a percent death in this room from this very large exposure every year. So we really don't know what goes on at low levels because it's, it's, it's washed out in this very high background. The good news here is that our cancer rates, incidents and death are going down over time as we get more aware of this stuff. Um, and like I said, this, is, this applies to every radiation modality, nuclear medicine, radiography, CT. Uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> There's, I thought the counter would be down. All right, so, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I wanna get through this pretty quick, so I give you guys plenty of time for questions. So this is, um, just to be aware, when you go to communicate risk to your patients, um, you know, an 80-year-old person getting radiation, they're not gonna live long enough to express that cancer, or to express that cardiovascular disease, so their risk is pretty low. Whereas, you know, infant or child, uh, they'll, it's much higher. So if you're going to go to communicate risk, the first step is know that risk versus benefit of that imaging modality. Why did they have to get a CT and not an MR? And there are legitimate reasons why, right? MR isn't good for all, all imaging studies. Um, you know, age, that sort of thing. Um, but when you do go to communicate, it's, it's very difficult. Every patient has their own sense of risk 
why is a CT horrible with this amount of risk, but yet pumping your gas every week, getting breathing in those carcinogens is okay. So, you know, the only thing you can do is try to relate it to what they're already exposed to. This radiation equi is equivalent to this many deaths from smoking a pack of cigarettes or, or something along those lines. Here's your CT is equivalent to this many days or months or years of radiation exposure. Um, generally, that sort of calms them down a little, but you always get uh, people that are afraid of, of the unknown. Um, this is sort of why we see cardiologists with hair loss on their legs. We shoot x-rays up through the patient because 99% is absorbed, right, or scattered. Uh, and so we scatter those where we don't have these sensitive organs, bone, yellow bone marrow, that sort of thing. And up here where we have red bone marrow and whatever, um, blood, uh, skin, whatever it is that's more sensitive, um, the patient is acting as a shield, and then we have um, lead vests that attenuate a, a really huge amount of this. These are the, the typical time, distance, and shielding you always hear about protecting yourself from, from radiation. Um, and uh, time is pretty obvious. If you don't have to be in the room, don't be in the room. Shielding is pretty obvious. This is a little more non-intuitive where if you're table side and you take a step back away from that tube, you're probably reducing your dose by 50, 75%. It's not very intuitive, but that less of that radiation is hitting you as you step back. Um, and then, you know, aware, be aware of your hazards as well. If the patient is your source of radiation, same deal, you know, be, be conscious. Don't sit bedside to them, take a step or two back, and that, gives, that buys you this huge uh, decrease in dose. Uh, as far as nuclear medicine, why don't we wear lead vests with nuclear medicine or PET? Uh, people actually did studies on this and found that on average we stay so far away from the patients that our dose is so low, wearing a lead vest doesn't buy us anything. And it actually is creating more physical injuries and bad knees and that sort of thing, wearing it eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. So it was not worth the injury, the amount of radiation that it spares you. If that makes sense, or if I talked in circles. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get to some questions. I wanna leave you with this. Image wisely and image gently. These are uh, internet sites that were set up to try and help patients and professionals sort of understand the risks of radiation. Why do I need this type of study rather than an ultrasound that doesn't give me any radiation, that sort of thing. There are tips on there on relating to patients when they come and ask, what's my dose and, and why is this needed, that sort of thing. This is my personal crude attempt at sort of uh, comparing the different modalities. MR, ultrasound, there is no radiation, no, no ionizing radiation, which is the radiation that actually splits the DNA. The rest, it's possible. The risks are pretty low, but it's a statistical process. So it, one piece of radiation can cause cancer.